everyone. My name is John Shear. I'm the director of sales at AppQs. Thank you for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build a product-driven sales team. Here's the agenda. We'll cover a little bit about me, what's different about product-led sales, and five plays you and your organization can run today. A bit about me. I used to be afraid that a, a free product trial was going to replace my job. Four years ago, when I was at HubSpot, um, you know, benefiting from one of the greatest marketing engines of all time, we were getting consultation requests, demo requests, ebook downloads, um, tons of leads every day. And, and one of the leads that we as a sales organization struggled the most with was uh, requests for a free trial. Every time somebody requested a free trial, we would push back on them. We would encourage them to instead hop on the phone with us and get a product demo. We were afraid at losing control within our sales process. But one of my colleagues, Mike, he wasn't afraid. Mike instead was leaning into the free trial. He believed that helping somebody use the product was actually the best way to get them to see value and then buy. He focused on solving for the customer, helping them really learn how to use the product, and he optimized for their usage. By getting them to use the product, they were less likely to abandon a sales process, and they were more likely to be successful users in the long term. Then when I came over to AppQs, it finally hit me. The trial wasn't the enemy because a trial still lacks one key ingredient that only a sales rep can provide. That's context. As a salesperson, we know what somebody's challenges are. We know how to map those challenges to their usage and we know how to make them most productive. So it's a combination of product and the context the salesperson can operate within that's going to lead to the best buying experience for a potential customer. So whether we like it or not, we're living in a post demo world. And this changes the sales process in a few ways. The first of which is that there isn't one set sales process. This is a core tenant about product led sales. So let's jump in. Here are your typical deal stages for your traditional inside sales model. We're gonna talk about why these don't fit a trial driven model. To begin, when somebody is going to trial your product, they're going to start to understand how it works and get value from it before you've ever connected. Some people may not need a classic demo at all to buy. And some people may not even get a demo at all. That's great. Selling within a trial is a race to customer value. So instead of looking at your sales process, look at their buyer's journey. Here's a look at the buyer's journey at AppQs. These are the things that a trialer is going to do within our product before they have to purchase, before they're going to hit a trial limit. Now, the key is, is aligning, aligning your sales process to what the buyer needs to do in order to make a purchasing decision. Now, the best part about making this change is that it works. Companies who are following product-led growth strategies have lower costs of sales. Are you ready to give your team the tools they need to succeed given the variability of a free trial sales model? If so, here are five plays you can run today. Play number one, align your sales and marketing efforts around true qualification. Most effective organizations have an SLA, which is an agreement between sales and marketing. Marketing commits to how many leads they should feed sales. Sales commits to the speed at which they're going to work these leads and how many times they're gonna follow up. Um, this agreement needs to shift focus from traditional leads or MQLs to trial leads, which are SQLs. Some organizations call them PQLs. Now, your sales org isn't going to succeed with trial-driven sales unless marketing is on board. So at AppQs, we use a tool called MadKudu. MadKudu scores our leads. It rates them very good, good, medium, and low. And our SLA is based on how many leads that marketing generates that are very good or good. And those are the leads that we give to salespeople. We score these leads on their likelihood to buy a package over a certain size. For us, this is important because some of our smaller packages don't make sense to have salespeople on. Um, and what's great about this as a sales or marketing leader is that if you're ever low on very good or good leads, you can dip into that medium pool to make sure your reps have what they need to hit their goals. Play two, 
Map your deal stages to prospect behavior, not rep behavior. We're too used to having individual reps uniquely interpreting deal stages for their forecasts. How can a rep justify a lead wants to buy if the product shows they haven't logged in in two weeks? Instead, we should be taking the things that somebody does in their trial and mapping those to our deal stages. At AppQs, our deal stages reflect the actions that somebody that indicates somebody will buy. So essentially, we've taken a product analytics tool and we've measured all of the different events that somebody might do within a trial and map them to how they impact purchase. So we know that if somebody invites a teammate into their trial, the likelihood that they buy is 16%. So we can take those individual events that somebody might do within a trial and we can map them simply to our deal stages. And this allows us to forecast um, very accurately when somebody is going to buy and their likelihood to buy in general. This takes the guessing out of forecast meetings. Now, if you're interested in setting something like this up for yourself, here are some questions that can help you not only qualify, but help you better forecast revenue. Um, you might wanna have these conversations with your sales team. How far along are your leads in a trial? How many actions have been taken? When was their last login? Have they used certain features before? Now, what's great about measuring everything here is that it can be objective, and that's gonna allow you to accurately forecast. Play three, find a balance between trial expiration and rep flexibility. People always want a longer trial, but it's important for your business to be firm. That said, trial expirations are not one size fits all. Some organizations get held back by legal, engineering, or other obstacles that eat up the trial time that's really valuable to them. The best solution here is to empower your sales team to be able to extend the trial for those who need a little more time and use that extension as a way to get leverage and moving the sales process along. At AppQs, we started by using Slack. With a simple ping, a rep can now extend a trial. So instead of the rep having to go to a prospect and say, hey, it's out of my control, I can't do anything here, they can offer a trial extension. And we typically do this in exchange for something that helps us move along a sales process, such as a firm date on when somebody is going to buy setting a timeline for when legal will redline our contracts, or booking an appointment with an engineer on the, on the prospects team. This is a really simple way to make sure that the people that are interested in buying your product are able to evaluate your solution holistically so that they're not gonna churn shortly after, but also making sure that people continue moving the sales process along with decent velocity. Play four, use product triggers to drive reps to action in real time. We've all heard about the art of the follow-up email, but a trial can help you contextualize those follow-ups. Instead of depending on email only, use product messages to help people move along in the buyer's journey. Ultimately, this will help you improve your conversion rates. So at AppQs, uh, we used to send the following email to trialers, encouraging them to invite a colleague. We know that when somebody invites a colleague, their likelihood to buy triples. But over our 14 day free trial, we were sending 10 emails between sales and marketing. We wanted to cut that down. And so what we did is we took some of those emails and instead of prompting a user to invite somebody via email, we prompt them to invite a user with an in-app message using app cues. This not only allows um, for us to send fewer emails, but they also an in-app message also has a much higher conversion rate because the context when you're messaging somebody is really on point. So from what we see, about 20% of people that see an in-app message will actually take the action you're encouraging. Um, if we could get 20% uh, click-through rates on our emails, that would be fantastic. So in-app compared to emails um, definitely can be a way more effective strategy. Now, what's key about this for our sales process is we've started to use a product called Hull, which actually allows our product and reps to work together. So now, when a lead does something of high value within the product, such as invite a teammate or install, we actually ping the rep in real time via Slack, letting them know that this just occurred. So instead of sending um, static emails to somebody, kind of pushing them along in the same sequence every time, we can message leads contextually. We can say, hey, I saw that you just took this action. You might want to consider doing this uh, next. 
And that allows us to add more value to somebody and it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to get somebody on the phone to learn more about your product. Um, always be adding value. The final play, play five. Have your sales reps take on support. Now, this one is always a bit uncomfortable with new reps, but having your reps handle the support of their free trialers is gonna help the whole purchase process move faster. AppQ sales reps spend 15 to 20% of their time doing support. The reason for this is it's all about meeting a buyer where they are in their journey. If somebody needs help using the product and the place that they're most likely to ask for help is support, I want our sales reps to be the folks that deliver the value that their leads are looking for. This is gonna help them build trust and help them do a better job at getting somebody educated on how to get value out of our product. Consider these two scenarios. Think about what you would prefer. You have a rep with little product knowledge and one of their leads submit, submits a support ticket on Thursday afternoon. Support responds within 48 hours, which is solid, and emails them with a response with a follow-up question that leads to another day and another follow-up. Or consider scenario two. By arming your reps with the knowledge to do support, a lead can submit a support ticket on Thursday afternoon. The rep sees that ticket, is pinged in Slack, and in real time can reply within four hours giving them the help that they need, and also giving the sales rep the opportunity to push for a phone call to help dig in a little bit deeper to the context that somebody wants to use AppQs within. What's a better experience for your buyer? What's a better experience for your sales team? Now, if you're on board with putting your sales reps on support, um, here's something that you should think about. To enable this, we dedicate the first two weeks of new hire sales training to product knowledge and support. Week one is all about learning the product. We have them go through seven trainings from the product team, and we have them use our product um, in real time with a real potential customer so that they can begin to empathize with our buyers. Week two, they're full-time on support. This allows them to take the knowledge that they've learned about our product and apply it in real time to help people with real business scenarios. At the end of the day, it's not about forcing your reps to change their selling style. And it's definitely not about forcing your clients to buy just because they signed up. It's about arming your reps with the tools they need to be flexible enough to help trialers understand the value the product delivers to them. Fortunately, you now have these five plays to use along the way. Thanks so much for your time. Once again, my name is John Shearer. Thanks for tuning in.